Shalom and good morning. It's our privilege to be able to introduce a good friend of mine this morning, Stephen Pigeon. And he is the founder, president, and CEO of Sefer Publishing Group. Those of you that know how we study the Lost Dead Sea Scrolls, it's because he has restored them back to the Bible through the Sefer. And Dr. Stephen is a political scientist with a doctorate in philosophy and an active attorney with a Juris Doctorate in the state of Washington. Many of you may not know, he also ran to be Attorney General here in Washington State. And he is responsible for the creation and publication of the Et Sefer, a comprehensive restoration of sacred scripture in the English language. Dr. Pigeon is a student of many languages, including Greek, Hebrew, Russian, French, Spanish, and Italian, an avid reader and author, and a great musician, if you didn't know. One of these days, we're going to have to do a little music uh, here for the group. That's right. And the harmonica. I'll bring the harmonica. So, and you've published over 30 books. Amazing how time flies and how much gets done when you are serving the Lord with all your heart, mind, and soul, as we're called to do. So thank you, my brother. Welcome to... Thank you, Isaac. Bokatov, Havrim, Mashlema, Mashlemka, Dobredin, my Druzia, Kakvi Pashvaitia, at the Harashov Vasvi Ditvis Nova. So today, it's just great to be here. I mean, what can I what can I say? Today, by special request, <laughs> we're going to talk about the migration of the tribes of Yasharel. Now when we talk about this migration, bear in mind that the Torah was always made available to those who claimed it. In other words, there were those who sojourned with the tribes of Yasharel who claimed jurisdiction under the Torah. A lot of people say, you know, Steve, where do you get the license to, you know, do these things concerning the scripture? Now, my commission comes out of Ezra 7.10. Ezra 7.10. That Ezra was a scribe and a lawyer who knew the Torah and was determined to bring the Torah to the nations. Now, I got to tell you, when I first read Ezra, I couldn't stand the book. I thought it was a bunch of racist diatribe. And then my commission comes out of Ezra 7.10. Now, what am I supposed to say? Now we have restored three Ezra and four Ezra to Scripture, and four Ezra, one of the most magnificent books, and certainly a prophetic book, and applicable to today's discussion. When we talk about this migration of the tribes, okay, very important, actually, in four Ezra. But I found three Ezra to be important, too, in my research and in my studies, because 3 Ezra is the only place in Scripture that tells you when the second temple was actually completed. Now we know it was begun under Nehemiah and Ezra came back and they said, let's get the temple going. We have a marker that the altar was completed. But what about the completion of the temple? Now it's very interesting that historians, secular historians, will look right to 3 Ezra, no problem. Hey, there's 3 Ezra, what's it say? Oh, it says here, here's the date. Oh, they don't have any problem with it. But somebody at the Scottish Rite Presbyterian Masonic Temple had a problem with it and said, we don't want this book in here. Get it out of here. You know the KJV, the 1611 KJV, had the Apocrypha in it. The 1560 Geneva had the Apocrypha in it. How'd they get kicked to the curb? Was it King James? No. John Calvin? No. Who was it? It was the Scottish Rite Presbyterians joining with the Anglican leaders in London to say we need to have an agreement between the Scots and the Brits concerning what scripture we should be out there because if we give them too much scripture they'll start arguing. <laughs> now that doesn't happen, does it? <laughs> and so under the Westminster Confession, under the Westminster Confession, the Bible is reduced. Well, I don't follow the Scottish Rite Presbyterians, nor am I subject to the opinion of the Crown. So we began to look and we said, what are these books? Why are these books missing? And of course, the Ruach HaKodesh himself opened the door. What door? The door to K4, the Qumran. Here's the door, it's wide open. Go in. You go into the cave, what do you find? 
I don't know. Let's throw a rock down there and see. Clink. Hey, there's something inside those vases. And what came out? The Dead Sea Scrolls. And in those scrolls, proof. In those scrolls, proof. And you know, so we hear a lot of scuttlebutt. There's a lot of discussion out there. Well, you know that in the Holy Land, uh, Jesus spoke Aramaic. Now you have to remember that Aramaic is the language of Aram. Aram, who was the son of Shem, who parked himself where? Syria. So Aramaic is another word for the language of Syria. Aramaic, Syrian. So, you know, you had Aram, you had Arphaxad, you had Elam, you had Shem, and you had Lud, right? These sons of Shem. And so where do they end up? Well, Lud is the one that's the most curious because Lud moved up into the Anatolian Peninsula and was known as Lydia, right? The area of Lydia or Ludia, Lydia. And when we talk about this migration of the tribes, by the way, we're going to be using inductive reasoning. Now, this is different than a lot of reasoning you get when you're, when you're doing uh, research, because most of the time in the Greek world, we like to do deductive reasoning. You know, we take this, can we corroborate that with some hard evidence that so-and-so said this, or this was published, or whatever. But when you do inductive reasoning, you have to look at what the historical usage was, and what these historical markers are. Are they dispositive? Are they definitive? Do they definitely tell you this is so? No, because we weren't there. And because we weren't there, and because we didn't co uh, collect you know, hard evidence, DNA samples, photographs, etc. We don't have that. What we have is we have a historical record that you can kind of put your hands over and go, oh yeah, that kind of feels like this, that kind of looks like this. So for instance, if you see a rock and the rock is consistent with other artifacts that are around the, the time from BC to AD, and on that rock, you see a menorah and some Hebrew script, you have a pretty good idea that somebody was writing Hebrew at that time in that place. So what did we get from the Dead Sea Scrolls? Well, if you study the Dead Sea Scrolls, you'll know that it's not in what you call modern Hebrew. It certainly did not evidence any nikud. That is, none of the vowel signs. There's no dots and lines consistent with the letters. You just have the letters. But what do we see in the Dead Sea Scrolls? What we see in the Dead Sea Scrolls is that the language of the scribes was in fact Hebrew, not Aramaic, not Greek, not Latin. And we can time the writing of the scrolls based upon the kind of pictograph or the kind of markings that they made. The closer they get to modern Hebrew, the newer the scroll is, right? So very important stuff. Now there were some things that, that were very illustrative out of the Dead Sea Scrolls, like the book of Isaiah being letter for letter, the Torah being letter for letter, Ezekiel being letter for letter, Psalm 119 letter for letter. But you also had fragments of Jasher, or not Jasher, but Jubilees and Hanok. In fact, Jubilees, six copies. And the fragments were from five different copies in Hanok. And interestingly enough, when they compared the Ethiopian text, which was the only text that was the oldest text of the book of Hanok, when they compared it to the Dead Sea Scroll fragments, what did they find? Word for word, right there in the pocket. So we believe that that was sufficient enough to say that's enough of a corroborative record for us to be able to include it, especially when you have 56 references to Hanok in the New Testament and you have a direct quote in the book of Jude and a direct reference in the book of 2 Peter. I mean, you have a quote. Actually, there's two quotes in the book of Jude. So if Enoch stinks and it needs to go, then so does Jude. The whole idea of talking about the elect, right? That passage in Luke during the transfiguration. 
you read it in most English Bible that says, this is my son, hear him. But they leave out the Greek word that's sitting right there and it's because it reads, this is my son, the elect one, hear him. Where do we get this term elect? We get it from Hanok, talking about the elect, right? Okay, so while we're talking about this now, when we go through these names, what we found by transliterating the names in the Sefer, it began to reveal things. It began to reveal where the tribes are and who the tribes are. Not only that, it began to re reveal the timing. Now, let me give you an example. The kingdom of David had a name. You know, like we, we live in the United States, right? But we call the place America. What did they call the kingdom of David? Yahud. Yahud. It was called Yahud. And those citizens of that kingdom were called Yahudis. Or in the plural, the Yahudim. The Yahudim. Now, it's interesting because you have this, you've got this situation with the name Iyawah. Now Josephus, we're getting ready to, we just published Josephus Antiquities. And we're getting ready to publish jo Josephus Wars of the Jews. And when I, when I was, you know, I was the initial editor on Antiquities. And so I'm going through Josephus and, and I'm going, okay, this is very interesting. Because man, does he in, introduce a boatload of Greeks, you know. Okay, yeah, we got all the Hebrew guys, but who, what are all these Greeks doing around here? <laughs> right? And then he introduces a boatload of Romans to boot. But what you see is in Josephus is you really have kind of a continuation of First and Second Chronicles, only in Josephus' was writing, and then he adds the Greeks and he adds all the Romans. And so it is a, you know, it's a collaboration of names like no other. And we went through, we said, well, look, all of the Hebrew names we're going to homogenize with the Sefer because we don't use the standard English version of the names. You know, you ever notice when you're reading in your KJV, you know, you're reading back here in the Old Testament, it says Elijah and it says Isaiah. And then you get into the book of Acts and all of a sudden you're talking about Elias and Esaias. Where'd these guys come from? Elias and Esaias? It's like in the KJV, you have the Holy Spirit three times in the Old Testament, but in the New Testament, you have the Holy Ghost. Well, now, wait a minute. You know, in the Hebrew, Ruach HaKodesh, right? Ruach HaKodesh, which is what? The Holy Breath. The Holy Breath. But in the Greek, the Hagia which means what? The Holy Breath. So why do we get Holy Ghost over here and Holy Spirit back there? I mean, it's just a question. Why do we get Elias over here, but Elijah back there? Esaias over here, but Isaiah back there? And even Isaiah, of course, is not correct because the Hebrew is Yeshayahu. Jeremiah, Yermayahu. Hezekiah, Yekiskayahu. But you see with these guys, Zakar Yahu, Obed Yahu, Yermai Yahu, Yisha Yahu, what do we have? We have this Yahu at the end, right? Whoop. Anyway, you have this Yahu at the end, right? What does this Yahu mean? Why is it doing there? Because it is a symbol of the time of the kingdom of Yahud. Now, the son of Yaakov, Yaakov, Jacob. He had how many sons? Twelve sons and a daughter, right? Twelve sons and a daughter. One of his sons is, we call him Judah. But in the Hebrew, Yahuda. Yod he vav he, no, no, Yod he vav dalit he. What's the Dalit doing there? Well, the Dalit is the door. Yahuda, the door to Yahuwah, yod he vav he. yod he vav dalit he, the doorway to yod he vav he. Now, D David, now get this. I mean, you guys are going to love this. 
is his name really David? Question. We get two different spellings for David, one in the, one in the older Old Testament, and then in, in the second temple writings, Ezra primarily, Ezra Daniel, when you get into the second temple writings, what do you find? Well, David is spelled there, Dalet Vav Yod Dalet. But in the older writings, it's Dalet Vav Dalet. Dalet Vav Dalet. Now, for those of you who know the Paleo-Hebrew, the Dalet is this. The Dalet is the triangle, like the delta in the Greek language. Because the Greek Cyrillic comes from the Paleo-Hebrew that the secular historians call Phoenician. Oh, the Phoenicians were a great people. You know, the Phoenicians had their own language. They gave us hooked on phonics, right? The Phoenicians, they were great sailors and they were all, they were just cool people that lived in the Middle East and they weren't like those people in Judea. They were the Phoenicians, the cool people. Truth is, who are the Phoenicians? The Northern Kingdom. The Northern Kingdom. And we're going to talk about that. We'll talk about who the Northern Kingdom is and what they did and where they are. Okay? But... Their language, Paleo-Hebrew, shows this Dalit like this, Dalit, right? Like a triangle. So the true star of David, and yes, there is a star of David, because it says a star shall come out of Judah. Now, there are people who say the star of David, that's the star of Remphan. It's a pagan occult symbol. But there is a passage that says a star shall come out of Judah. What star? Well, yes, it's, it is a symbol of Mashiach to, Mashiach to come. But this star, this Dalit, showing what? Pointing to heaven and a Dalit pointing to earth. Now, here's where the symbol, this Magan David, the Mogan David, Magan David, this star that you see on the flag of Israel, here's where it goes wrong. It's missing the Vav. It's missing the Vav. Now, what is the Vav? If you see the Paleo-Hebrew Vav, it's like a Y, right? It's like you have the leg here, it's like a Y. But it kind of circles like this with a Y, the Vav. What is the Vav? It's Mashiach. It's Mashiach on the cross. And the Vav is missing. You see? Dalet, Dalet, but where is the Vav? It's missing from the true Star of David. Right? The Magan David. But what you see is Dalit Vav Dalit. Now, how did you pronounce that? Well, the Vav is pronounced U. So the real pronunciation of his name, dude. <laughs> dude. A dude. What it is. You know. King Dude. But by the time you get the first and second chronicles, he becomes David. David. In the Arabic world to this day, they use the name Daud. Daud. Implying an awe following the first Dalit. Daud. Right? We have many people in our group whose name is David. But they have been called that in a long time. <laughs> okay. I'll be Yitzhak Ben Dude from here on out. <laughs> ben Dude. There it is. So, but when we go back and we look at this name of Yaakov, Yaakov, Yaakov is renamed. Now we look at this and we see this Yod Shin Resh, Yod Shin Resh. Aleph Lamed, right? And so people say, well, Israel, right? Yod Shin Resh Aleph Lamed, Israel. But when we look at the name Jasher in the book of Jasher, Yod Shin Resh, Yashar, Yod Shin Resh. And in the Russian, they call this book the Book of the Upright. The Book of the Upright, Yashar. And who is Yashar but the Upright One? And so when we talk about Yashar El, we're talking about the upright in El. The upright in El. So, but people will say, well, it's Israel. Well, why is it Yashar? Why is Shin Resh always Shar? Why is Yod Shin Resh suddenly Israel? Now, if that Shin is pronounced Ish with a Sha instead of a Sa, it becomes Ish. Ra-El. 
the wicked man in El. Ish, man, Ra, evil, El. Ishrael, the wicked man in El. But it's not, it's Yashar El, because Yah appears at the beginning, if my people who are called by my name, who are the people called by his name? Yashar El. Remember, it's, yeah, the upright one instead of the evil one. And we see in Yov Helim, it tells us what, there are 22 generations from Adam to Yaakov, the 22 patriarchs consistent with the 22 letters of the Hebrew language. And then we hit the tribes of Yasharel. And history begins with the tribes of Yasharel. And the covenant begins with the tribes of Yasharel. Because in Genesis it says, Yasharel is my firstborn son. But Yov Helim, Jubilees, is going to explain this to us. It's going to tell us the rest of the sentence. The seed of Yasharel is my firstborn son. The seed. Now, what does that mean? Well, it's telling you, I'll give you an example. If we look out at that birch tree, if we were here four months ago, that birch tree looked deader than a doornail. There wasn't a leaf on it. If you didn't have the experience of seeing it bud every other year, you would say, if that was the first time you'd ever seen that tree and it was your first winter, that tree's dead. But it isn't because the life continues, because the seed, the birch tree, is the firstborn, but the leaves return year after year after year. Now, this seed of Yasharel is, of course, Mashiach. And this is why this passage that is given to us in Matthew 1, you know, the, the passage everybody passes out reading, and then Abraham begat Isaac, and Isaac begat Jacob, and Jacob begat Judah, and Judah begat Perez, and ah, <laughs> right? Until you realize what's being discussed there. And once you realize what's being discussed there, now we have a critical question. Is Yahusha, the Mashiach, a son of Judah. Yes, because he's a son of Perez, as was David. Is he a son of Natan, the son of David? No, he's the son of Shalomah, the son of David. Yosef, the husband of Miriam, the son of Natan, the son of David. Mashiach, the seed of the woman, the son of Shalomah whose mother, Bathsheba, what does that mean in the Hebrew, Bathsheba? Bat is daughter. Sheba could mean seven. Yeah, she could be the seventh daughter, Bathsheba. But she could also be the daughter of Sheba. You remember Sheba? You remember the queen of Sheba? The queen of Sheba who came to visit Shalomah? Was that his grandmother? Maybe. Maybe. But we have this very interesting litany. Now, what's important about Matthew 1 is what? It says there are 14 generations from Abraham to David and 14 generations from David to the Babylonian captivity. Now, the Babylonian captivity, the last king there, is a guy named Yekonyahu. In the English scripture, Jeconiah. Yekonyahu. Yekonyahu is the last king to have Yahu at the end of his name. The next one is Shealtiel. Zerubbabel is the one after that. Do you see? There's nobody that has the name Yahu after that because the kingdom of Yahud ended. You see? Yahudim. All right. Now we've got some interesting historical markers. We know that the northern kingdom was destroyed permanently with the attacking of the Assyrians in the year 722 BC, right? What was the capital of the northern kingdom at that time? What was the fortress of Ephraim at that time? 
Where had the bricks fallen and they replaced them with hewn stone? Where did the sycamore come down and they planted cedars? Where was it? Was it in Shechem? Nope. It was in the fortress of Ephraim, i.e. Damascus. Who's living up there? Well, you have a very interesting story that talks about, now, you know, th these blessings begin where? In Genesis 48. Yaakov begins his blessings in Genesis 48. The first one to be blessed is the Et Yahid. That is to say, Joseph, the favored son. Who was the son that Yaakov loved most? It was Joseph. You know, you read Jasher, the grief that you see in Yaakov over the death of Joseph is unbelievable, right? And if you recall, who was it that wanted to kill Joseph? It was Judah. Let's kill him. That whippersnapper, that punk with the fresh mouth telling us he's going to rule over us, right? Him in his new coat. His coat of many colors, how many colors? 22 colors or 12 colors? Probably 12. Let's kill him. And who was it that said, nope, let's don't kill him, just put him in the pit? Reuben. It was Reuben. But Reuben would lose his birthright to Joseph because Joseph was the Et Yaquid, the beloved one. And so when it comes time for Joseph to come in and say, okay, father, I'm here. You know, uh, Yaakov turns 140 years old. Pharaoh looks at him and says, man, 140, wow. He says, what's it like to live to be 140? He says, how's your life been? Yaakov says, evil and short. <laughs> at 140, right? But Yosef comes in and he says, you know, uh, I'm here for the blessing. He says, but I don't want you to bless me. I want you to bless my two sons, the sons of Asenath. You know, she had sons after this, but these two sons were the blessing. I want you to bless my two sons, my oldest Manasseh here, my youngest Ephraim. And so he puts Manasseh on his right leg and he puts Ephraim on his left leg. He says, now bless him. And Yaakov says, okay, I'll do that. <laughs> and he promptly crosses his hand. Joseph like, hey, wait a minute. No, no, that, dad, this hand here, that hand here. And he says, I know exactly what I'm doing. This one will be a great company of nations. This one will be a great nation. Now that's going to become extremely important in our modern understanding. A great company of nations and a great nation. Singular. Okay. Well, Manasseh turns out to be quite the kid. Manasseh means he forgets. Right. But Manasseh turns out to be a ferocious fighter warrior extraordinaire. So when it comes time, hey, let's go take the Holy Land. Let's go take the Holy Land. So they get there. You know, Moses is out there. I can't go in. Why not? Because I struck the rock. He told me to speak the rock and I struck it. Because being a hothead, I stepped outside the boundary again. So Joshua is going to lead the tribes over the Yardan the river of Dan. Okay, but before they go, there's a land grant given to Reuben, the tribe of Gad. No, we always say we talk about that tribe. Well, that was Gad and the tribe of Dan. Now it's pronounced God and Don. You know, D-A-N, Don. It's like, there used to be this French president, Jacques Chirac. But the Brits like to call him Jack Chirac, you know, <laughs> Jack Chirac. Well, <laughs> when you're talking about the tribe of Dan, it's pronounced Don. When you're talking about the tribe of Gad, it's pronounced God. And so when God gets taken into captivity over the river Sebat Tiron, which is now the Bosporus, into the Slavic areas of Europe, they say, let's worship the deity of that tribe of God. Let's worship the deity of God. Let's worship God. Do you see it? And God became God. And God became Goat. And Goat was spelled by the Germans with a T-H, which is one way of spelling the Tav. Goat, which was pronounced by others as Goth. 
and they became known as the Visigoths and the Ostrogoths, the Eastern Goths, Goth people and the Western Goth people. Now these Western Gothic people, the tribe of God, they continued to migrate. So the Visigoths, they're up there in Austria, they're up there in the Czech Republic, they're up there in Southern Germany. And they're sitting around, well, what do you think we should do? Well, I don't know, will you do anything this weekend? Nah, okay, let's go burn Rome, great idea. <laughs> so down they go, burn Rome. You know, a couple years later, what are you up to? I don't know, what do you say we burn Rome again? So they burned Rome eight times. And then these same group of people then came over the Alps, you know, through Lombardy, and they came into France, and they went into Spain. And then from Spain, they migrated across into Morocco and over here into Tunisia. Hey, we're in Tunisia, we're pretty close to Rome. What do you say we go burn it? Good idea. <laughs> so they did, and they were called the Vandals. They were called the Vandals. That's what it means to vandalize. It means to burn Rome. There's nothing to do with any tagging with a paint can. It means burning Rome, okay. But this was the Gothic people. Now, so you see you these young people who say, well, I dress like a goth. Oh, you're in the tribe of God. Uh, what? Oh yeah, you've got a biblical historical foundation for wearing that black stuff in the school. I do? Yeah, oh yeah. You're in the tribe of God. Of course, you're in exile. You're in diaspora. A different portion of the Torah is gonna kick in where you're concerned. <laughs> right? But you have, and you had, so the tribe of God and the tribe of Reuben and the tribe of Manasseh, the half tribe of Manasseh, were given this portion to the east of the River Jordan. And so God was given this portion that is now what we, what we would call Moab. And then Reuben was given this portion called Ammon, which is where Ammon Jordan is today. And Manasseh was given this area called Bashan. But Bashan had a problem. What was the problem? They had a king. Now this king was pretty big. How big? Well, his bed was 18 cubits. Okay, so he was probably 30 something feet tall. Now, when you see one of these Nephilim or Rephaim or Eliu, depending on the generation, you're not talking about a tall skinny guy, right? Oh yeah, that guy was 32 feet tall and he weighed 450 pounds. Let's try again. He was 30 feet tall and probably weighed 4,500 pounds. Massive, big person. And who took him on and killed him? Manasseh. Manasseh. They liberated Bashan. Manasseh liberated Bashan. Where is Bashan today? Well, okay, let's look at Israel, okay? Israel, come, you've got the little point down here. Up it comes here, then you've got this little thing that sticks up here, right? Kiryat Arba, city of Dan, Golan Heights. Cross the Golan Heights into Syria, cross right into Bashan. Where are all of these troops amassed in the modern world today? Where are the Germans, the French, the Americans, the Brits? They're amassed in Bashan. And where was Damascus? In Bashan, the, fortrim, uh, the fortress of Ephraim, Damascus, which would be defended by this tribe of Manasseh, a ferocious tribe. So the theory was this, put Manasseh up there. You know, the, the script says, Manasseh didn't want to live in that little tiny land grant they had outside of Tel Aviv. We can't live there, are you kidding me? That's one city, we need a little more room than that, okay. We'll give you this land grant over here. But the truth is, Joshua said, put Manasseh out there. They are the warriors. Let anybody who wants to deal with us come through Manasseh first. Somebody finally figured out how to do it. Who was it? The Assyrians. Ashur. Ashur, also a son of Shem. Ashur was also a son of Shem. But they had developed a compound bow that was so powerful, its power was only exceeded in World War I. That's how powerful that compound bow was. And so when the Assyrians showed up on horseback with that compound bow, they were capable of taking everybody down. And they came in initially well before 722 BC and knocked down the stones knocked down the bricks so they replaced with hewn stone they took down the sycamore so they planted the cedar we will come back 
We will, we, on our own initiative, we will make ourselves more powerful than we were before. Come, let us build a tower, it says in the Septuagint. But in, da in Isaiah 9, 10, it says a word of death came upon Yaakov and lighted upon Ephraim. A word of death. This is what it says in the Septuagint. It's a curse. And they ascribed to the curse, and sure enough, in 722, the entirety of the northern kingdom fell. But at this point, you'd already had a large dispersion of the tribes. Now, let's talk about it. Who was the seafaring tribe in this group? It's the tribe of Dan, or Don, the tribe of Don. Now, the tribe of Don, to get from, you know, Yafo, or Akko, there on the coast of Israel, to the Straits of Gibraltar is farther than it is to go from the tip of Africa to South America. Okay? And we know that during Solomon's time, they discovered that if you go floating out there in the South Atlantic, there is no wind. Which is why they developed a ship called the Byream. What's the Byream? The Byream is a sail and two decks of oarsmen. So you sail until there's no wind, and then you hit the oars. Very simple solution. What does a Viking ship look like? Right? It's a sail with oarsmen. See? All right. The tribe of Dan then sailed out across the Mediterranean, and the tribe of Dan was putting themselves down. Now, to give you an example, the princes of Dan claimed a, an island in the middle of the Mediterranean. Now, prince, the word prince in Hebrew is what? Sar. So if you read in Isaiah where he talks about the Prince of Peace, it is the Sar Shalom, the Prince of Peace, Sar Shalom. So Sar, prince, and then Dan, the princes of Dan, and let's call the, let's call the land after Yah, I am, the great I am, Yah. So, Sar, Dan, Yah. Sardinia. The island of Sardinia was claimed by the tribe of Dan. And the tribe of Dan sailed out to Sardinia, and they also sailed around the Horn, and the tribe of Dan made a substantial landing and built a population in the places that we now call Cameroon, Cote d'Ivoire, Ghana, Nigeria. Big population of the House of Dan in that area. The House of Dan also went up and sailed around the northern end of what we call Ireland. And so Don, the tribe of Don, they landed and began to live with the people who called themselves Gauls. Gauls. So it was Don E. Gaul. Donegal. Donegal. Okay? That's an area in the northern part of Ireland. It's called Donegal. Now you keep going to the northern part of Scotland and you run into a clan there that calls themselves MacDonald. Now the Mac means son of. So you have the Scots, MacDonald, and you have the Irish, MacDonald. MacDonald versus MacDonald. That's why the derogative name, derogatory name for the Irish is Mick. Mick, not Mac. Right? MacDonald, not MacDonald. But Mac means son. Son of who? Son of Don. Son of Don. And when we land on a little bit of land south of there, let's mark it after us and let's call it Don's Mark. Don's Mark. So the coast of Norway, the peninsula of Don's Mark, the northern part of Scotland, the northern part of Ireland, all tribe of Don. Vikings, right? Seafarers. Seafarers. Now, the tribe of Don were not polite people. I'm just going to tell you that. These guys were not nice guys. And in fact, half the tribe were known as the sons of Belial. And they were wicked guys. 
So 600 of them, they're hanging out there on the seacoast. What land grant was their land grant? Yafo, Tel Aviv, right? Of course, there was no Tel Aviv then. There was only Yafo. They're like, this isn't big enough for us. Well, now there's two million people there. You guys could have handled two million people, Don, but you said that's not big enough. You know, try to figure out how to build an apartment building, right? Then you wouldn't have this problem. But they said this land grant's not big enough for us. So 600 of them go wandering out and they go over to Benjamin. Now, even though Benjamin will try to tell you that they had the city of Jerusalem, they did not because the Jebusites had that city. Now, Isaac will know this because he's a good Hebrew letter scholar. You know, the bait in Hebrew, right? With a line, right? So you have this with a line, bait. But if we drop the line, what is it? Resh. If the line disappears, that bait becomes resh, right? So we know that Malachid Sadiq, that Abraham went to see, was the king of where? Salem. But in the Hebrew, Shalom. So, and who was this Malachit Sadiq at that time? Shem, according to Jasher. The Shem was, does that mean he was the Malachit Sadiq? No, he was in the order of Melchizedek. He was in the order of Melchizedek. But he's hanging out as the king of Shalom. Well, that town Shalom would become a citadel under the Jebusites. That is to say, they built a castle there that was impregnable until David shows up and realizes, I can get in there through the Gihon Springs. We can climb up from underneath. The same way that Babylon would fall to Koresh or Cyrus the Great. So they built a, a strong citadel there and they said, we don't even need to defend it. This place is impregnable. We don't have to have an army, you can't get in. And the town was called Jebu Shalom. But no J in the Hebrew, actually Yevu Shalom. Yevu Shalom. However, if you drop that line under the B in Yevushim, it suddenly becomes Yeru Shalom. Okay? But at the time of these sons of Belial, Jerusalem was not in the hands of Benjamin. It was in the hands of the Jebusim who were still living there. But Benjamin had his land grant and his capital, what is now Ramallah, was called Ramah back then. It's the Palestinian capital. This is where Benjamin lived. And these sons of Belial show up. This is in, in the Judges uh, 16, 17, 18, 19. The sons of Belial show up and they say, hey, you know, we're hanging out here making trouble, looking for somebody to fight. Well, this guy comes down and he's a Levite priest and he wants to get a wife. So he goes down to Judah and he finds this gal and he brings her up from Judah. And of course, Judah was what? Hebron, spelled in the English, Chevron. Hebron, right? He's down, he goes down and gets this gal from Hebron and he's taking her back up, and he, but he can't make it all the way home. So he stops in Ramah. I need a place to sleep. This guy says, don't sleep out here in the square. Whatever you do, don't sleep out here. You come over to my house. You can stay at my house, but don't sleep out here. Okay, all right, great. We'll come over to your house. So he gets over to the house. Who shows up? The sons of Belial. Boom, 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 boom. Hey, bring the guy out here so we can have relations with him. So the old man who's in the house is thinking, well, that sounds a lot like Sodom and Gomorrah. Right? And if you recall, Lot said, well, okay, look, don't send the angels out, send the two daughters out. And he put his two daughters out there, and those guys were so weird, they wouldn't touch the two daughters. So this guy's thinking the same thing. Well, let's send the girls out. You know, send out your gal from, from Judah, and I'll send out my gal, and then that'll keep them away. Well, when it comes time to send them out, he chickens out, and they just send the girl out from Judah. They send her out there. Well, guess what? These guys from the tribe of Dan, were pretty wicked. And the following morning, they find her dead in the doorway. And so this priest cuts her body up into 12 pieces and sends it to one chunk to the 12 tribes and says, never has a crime been so bad in all Israel. And so the, all of Israel gathers up and comes to Benjamin and says, okay, you did this crime, cough up the murderers. And Benjamin said, what? wasn't us. 
but if you're going to pick a fight, we'll give you one. Right? And Judah's like ready to scrap. Let's do it. Right? And what happens? Well, they have this war, and the war eventually turns out that Judah, with a little bit of help, slaughters everybody in Benjamin. Every adult male and every adult female. Save 600 who were hanging out in the cave saying, don't hurt us. Who were the 600? The same 600 who picked this fight, the sons of Belial, who were from the house of Dan, who would go on to strike a city dead north and say, this is a cool place. Look, nobody's defending them. They go up and kill them all, take their houses, take all their cattle, everything else. And that is the city of Dan now in the northern part of Israel. Maybe the most grievous sin in all of the history of Israel for which Benjamin was blamed but it's a crime that Dan committed. That's why you don't see the tribe of Dan named in the book of Revelation. Because of that crime. Now, we had the tribe of Dan going out the Mediterranean, around to Africa, going around into the Nordic area, okay? But there's another tribe of Dan, the tribe of Dan that was over here, that would leap out of Bashan leap out of Bashan. Now that means they're going to go north over the Hittite Empire into the Black Sea. And when they went into the Black Sea, they went up a passage called the Dardanelles, and they went into the Black Sea and began to populate up four rivers, all of which were named for the tribe of Dan. The Don River, the Don Neper, the Don Nestor, and the Danube. And you can follow those rivers up, and you will still see in the nation of Hungary, there are two cities, one to the north and one to the south, of Budapest that are named after Don. There is a city well up 400 miles up the Don River in Russia that's named after Don, Don Nestor. You have Don Nestor, the eastern Don River. You have Rostov nad Danu in Russia. These are all places where the tribe of Don populated. Okay, but this is the eastern tribe of Don, or you might even call them the wicked tribe of Don that had done this. But I'm telling you, even the western tribes, the Vikings were known for ruthless slaughter. Show up, burn the village down, kill everybody, steal everything, get on the boat and head home. Tribe of Don. But the tribe of Don has a lineage in Ireland. The tribe of Don has a lineage in Scotland. The tribe of Don has a lineage in Norway. The tribe of Don has a lineage in Denmark, in Hungary, in Ukraine, in Romania, and in Russia, and in Nigeria. It's interesting now because really, the tribe of Don in Nigeria, Cote d'Ivoire, Cameroon, they're black Africans, right? Interesting. Okay, tribe of Don. What about Manasseh? Now I told you Manasseh were fearsome fighters, right? Well, Manasseh, when Manasseh gets captured, the Assyrians say, don't put them with the tribe of Reuben, and don't put them with the tribe of God. Get these guys out of here. These guys are too ferocious. Get them out of here. Take them as far out of here as you can get them. So they took them, and they took them east of the Euphrates, and they took them east of the Caspian Sea. You guys hang out over here. They put them over there north of the Indus River Valley in what is now modern-day Afghanistan. Turkmenistan. Well, this tribe, Manasha, they didn't mess around. They became known as the Masajeti, the Masajeti. And this tribe, Manasha, as the Masajeti, they were the ones that killed Alexander the Great. Alexander the Great says, we're here, we're here to conquer, we're here to kill. And, and the tribe of Manasha is like, yeah, we hear you. Come on down, we hear you. Right? And the famous story is Alexander is going up and down the river. He's trying to figure out a place to cross because Manasseh is on the other side of the river. They were waiting for you. Get over here. Get over here. And as soon as he crossed, boom, he's dead. And the whole of the Alexander kingdom, the Greek kingdom, breaks into four parts as predicted in Daniel 11. Right? So what you see here is this tribe of Manasseh now is going to continue to grow and to continue to become more powerful and they're ferocious fighters. Eventually, they end up as a kingdom under Genghis Khan. 
who is Genghis Khan and the Mongols? Masajete, tribe of Manasha. How did they fight? With bows on horseback. That tribe would also come over the so-called land bridge, right? Oh, we had, there used to be a land bridge between, you know, Russia and Alaska. Trust me, in the winter, when the Bering Sea freezes, you can walk over on the ice. Okay? You don't need a land bridge. And guess what? From the time of Noah forward, there's always been the boat. There has always been the boat. You didn't need a land bridge to get somebody to Hawaii. Right? But anyway, these tribes began to migrate over, and these tribes do have residue in North America, i.e. from the, from the Masajete, from the, the tribe of Manasha, the Athabascan, the Klingon, the Arapaho, the Navajo, the Apache, all known as ferocious fighters. Okay? It's very interesting that the Navajo, they call the name of their tribe Diné, Diné. He said, well, why do you call yourself Diné? Okay, well, who was the daughter of Judah that got raped in Shechem? D Dinah, Diné. And she ends up with a daughter who is taken captive and is held by an Egyptian, that daughter's name, Asenath. Now, Asenath, when you read the story of Joseph and Asenath, by the way, incredible story. It's just magnificently beautiful. I love the book. If you order a Sefer now, but you got to order it quick, we'll send you a copy, a free copy of jo Joseph and Asenath, Yosef and Asenath. Beautiful story. There's a point in there where, where Yosef, he meets Asenath, and Asenath has heard of Yosef. He's the guy that got thrown in prison for accused of rape. I don't want to see the guy, I don't want to meet the guy, I don't want to know about him, just keep him out of here. Then he comes into the room and she's absolutely blown over by his radiance. And so she goes down to meet him and she, and he goes, she goes to meet him and he touches her and the instant he touches her he says, it is not proper for a son of Yasharel to have anything to do with a person who has eaten meat sacrificed to idols just from touching her. So she goes upstairs and repents, tosses all her idols out the window, right? And she's visited by a certain someone, i.e. Mashiach, who comes to her after a, a, a week of praying and fasting, he comes to her in, in the nighttime and he takes her repentance. It's a magnificent story, this Joseph and Asenoth. But Asenath, her mother, Dineh, she doesn't look Egyptian. Her mother, Dineh. And so, who does Manasseh call themselves after? Dineh. It's like, who does the tribe of Zarah call themselves? Do they call themselves after Judah, their father? Or after Yitzhak? No. Who took the name of Yitzhak? Ephraim. You shall be called after the name of Isaac. Ephraim. But what does the house of Zarah call themselves? Hebrew. After Abraham's grandfather, a bear. Right? What do they call the Spanish Peninsula? The Iberian Peninsula. And the people there? Iberian. Or as the Hebrew might say, a barian. Eber, you read it in your, in your text, in the English text, Eber, the grandfather of Abraham. But if you look closely at the Hebrew, the word is Ebro. What's the name of the main river in Spain? Ebro. What's the one of its major cities? Zara Gosa. Named after who? Zara, the son of Judah. Remember that when Judah, you know, Judah, let me tell you, not a perfect guy by any means. I'm not going to take the time to get into the whole story of his relationship with Tamar. But suffice it to say that she ends up pregnant with twins. And during the birth, the hand emerges and the midwives put a red ribbon around it. Then the hand is withdrawn. Then the child without the red ribbon is born. The child without the red ribbon, Ferez. The child with the red ribbon, Zara. 
So Zara is historically depicted as the red rampant lion. How many have stayed in the Red Lion Hotel? Red Lion Hotel, right? Red rampant lion, right? That is the house of Zara. Golden rampant lion, you know, the rampant lion, right? Golden rampant lion, house of Ferez. So the house of Ferez called themselves Ferashim or Perashim. We know them as Pharisees. Perashim, the house of Ferez. The house of Zara calls themselves Hebrew or Iberian or Iberian. Okay? They don't call themselves, you know, Joseph or, or Zara. They call themselves after these other names. Same thing with Manasseh, who calls themselves Dineh, after the mother, because Ephraim, it gets the patrilineal, patrilineal name, which is Yitzhak. And Yitzhak is not Yitzhak, it's Yitzhak. Double A, Yitzhak. How do we know this? Because his, history tells us that they were called Sa'aka. They were known historically for thousands of years as Sa'aka. Before that, Sa'akithians. Sa'akithians. The Sa'aka, the Sa'akithians. And again, the historians, oh, the Sa'akithian people, oh, they were this, that, and the other thing, and blah, blah, blah. As long as they're Scythian, everything's great. As soon as you find out that they're the house of Judah, oh, those people are horrible. Right? Sa'akithians, house of Ephraim, they would become known as the Sa'aka. The sons of Sa'aka are known as the Sa'akashvili. Their country that they used to inhabit to protect the tribes of Israel who were in Ukraine became known as Sa'akardvelo. Sa'akardvelo, which is today called Georgia. Georgia. And the people are the Sa'aka. Ephraim. But the Saakashvili in Saakadvelo, when they moved into Germany, became known as Saaksons. Saxons. And the Saxons would migrate into England. Now, England, you remember I told you that one of the sons of Shem, whose name was Lud, and they had an area in Turkey called Lydia. Their capital city was formed by a son of Zara, whose name was Darda, and he formed the capital city, which was called Troy. His brother formed the capital city of another area in Thrace called Athens. These are the two sons of Zara, right? A third son populated and formed the city of Cadiz in Spain. So you had Troy in the area of Lydia, which was the tribe of Lud, the son of Shem. And when that tribe of Lud was defeated in the Trojan War, they packed it up and moved. And I mean, they really moved. They moved across Europe and they formed a city called Lud on a mountain that was called Mount Lud. Now, Mount Lude in the 29th chapter of the book of Acts, which is found exclusively in the Et Sefer, unless you find the fragment online, it tells you that Paul, the worker, preached after he transgressed through Spain, that he preached at Mount Lude. And so where he preached at Mount Lude now has a cathedral called what? St. Paul's. East Gate of London. The East Gate of London. Okay, so here the city is called Lude. How did it become London? When the tribe of Dan attacked it. Lude Dan. And it becomes London. Lude Dan, London. The house of Lude, Shemitic people. Okay? But the Saxons and the Anglos, all of the house of Ephraim, would occupy this land called Britain. And remember what the promise was in Genesis 48, Ephraim would become a great company of nations. Now, at the time of World War II, it was said that the sun did not set on the British Empire. And if you go back and you look at one of those maps, you'll see everything that England had was in pink, right? There's Great Britain, then there's Canada, there's India. This was before Pakistan split off. India included Bangladesh and Pakistan. That was British Empire. 
British East Africa, Kenya, right? There wasn't any Kenya in 1961 when Barack Obama was born. Kenya didn't occur until 1964. It was British East Africa. South Africa was also pink. Australia, New Zealand, pink. The sun did not set on the British Empire. And right now, as we speak, the Queen controls 52 votes in the United Nations. Why? Because it is a great company of nations. All right, now what happens to Menasha? Well, Menasha, as I told you, pretty, pretty fierce. And the Khan decided, let's go out and conquer the world. We can conquer the world, and so he did. And out he comes with the Mongolian hordes who would come in on horseback, and they were capable of standing on top of the horses and shooting, you know, while they're at full gallop, these kinds of things, right? Ferocious band of murderers. And they came across the Russian steppes and conquered the whole area. Afghanistan, of course, their own, you know, their old stomping ground. Reconquered all of that, through Pakistan, all of that, conquered that. Chased the Ottomans out of Eastern Turkey. And then they began to conquer Europe. Well, they're coming in here to take Europe. Let's send out the Knights Templar. Send out the Knights Templar. Those guys have been trying to defend the Holy Land. Get them out there. Khan wiped them out. So the Khan moves in all the way into Poland, ready to strike and take all of Europe, and what happens? The Khan dies, and all of the warlords have to go back to the capital to pick the next Khan, and they never bothered coming and reattending Europe after that. That's the only thing that saved Europe. It wasn't a fighting force that defeated him. So the Khan sets up shop in a, in a town called Astrakhan. Now this town, Astrakhan, used to be called Attil. And Attil was the capital of the Khazarian Empire. Now a lot of people out there say, oh, these Jews today are all fake Jews. They're all Khazar Jews, Khazarian Jews. I don't know if you've heard this rhetoric. But it's out there, the scuttlebutt's out there big time. The truth is, is that the, the Khazarian Empire actually included all 12 tribes of the House of Israel. Because the northern kingdom had been taken and taken eastern. Now, even though Gad, Reuben went this way, portions of that tribe ended up in the Indus River Valley. And when Judah was taken captive into Babylon with Benjamin and Levi, following the collapse in 586, they populated in Babylon. Only 45,000 went back to Jerusalem. They populated Babylon. And the 10 tribes who populated the Indus River Valley began to become dominant and powerful, known as the Parthian Empire. And let me tell you, they were bad news. They told the Romans, stay on the other side of the Euphrates River. And the Romans said, oh yeah, we can do that, great. Don't come over this side of the Euphrates. You stay over there, we'll stay over here, don't come over. Well, this one Roman general said, oh, well, I'm gonna go over. I got 70,000 troops and 10,000 cavalry. I'm going over. I'm Roman. So he goes over and sacks a few villages. So the Parthians show up. And they're wearing, you know, goat fur. And they're on some, you know, uh, you know pony. <laughs> Let's run, right? And so they keep luring the Romans in. And they're doing this, and they're doing this, and doing this, to find that Romans get right in this nice big valley. And the next thing you know, 40,000 heavy cavalry in chain mail. They slaughtered every last Roman, and the Roman general that cut his head off, filled his mouth with gold, with melting gold, and then dipped his hand in gold and sent his head and his hand back to Marcus, uh, Mark Anthony and said, that's what we think of your commitment to not cross the Euphrates. That would eventually turn into a battle between Rome and Parthia that would kill a million men on both sides, from which Western Rome never recovered. They had to hire mercenary armies from that point forward. They could never recover. The Parthians, in the meantime, are sitting there in the Indus River Valley, and we have real-time global warming, right? It's 11 degrees centigrade hotter than it is now. So every summer, you get 140, 550 degrees. Hey, you guys like this? No, this, get me out of this. Well, we heard rumor that all of the ice in Europe has melted. Is that right? 
great rivers, lots of ports, places for fortresses, we can do it. Boom, they go right over the Caucasus Mountains into what is now Southern Russia and Ukraine in an area that was called Kazaria. And when they crossed over the mountains called the Kafkas, we also know them as the Caucasus, they became called the Caucasian people because they crossed the Caucasus. So they were known as the Caucasians. But it was all 12 tribes of Israel and their kings were all from the house of Perez. They called themselves Gondo Perez, the kings. They were all from the house of Perez. They had to establish lineage and the tribe of Judah to be the king. So were there Jews in Kazaria? Yes. Were there Levites in Kazaria? Who were the Levites? There's a group of people who, when the Levites do not have an inheritance. Am I right about this? They have no inheritance. Is there a group of people out there right now that has no inheritance? Gypsies. Gypsies. The gypsies have no inheritance. Roma. And they say, we're Roma, right? And where did you come from? Oh, we came from Pakistan around 250 AD. The Indus River Valley around 250 AD. Oh, is that right? Well, that's the rest of the time the rest of the Parthian Empire trend came through. Guess what? Guess who Levi is? And the, yeah, the house of Asaf, right? Asaf, Gershon. Remember, he was responsible for the temple musicians. Well, go, to, go scratch a gypsy, find a musician, right? And you'll find it instantly. And so you see that all of these tribes were present in Ukraine, right? All of the tribes were present there. Okay, now I mean, I, I know I've gone along too far, but I want to show you, I want to, I want to talk to you a little bit about the tribe of Asher, because this is going to be important too. Because Asher and his sons are actually the father of the Jesuits, okay? I'm not gonna, I can't link that up all today, but th this is the case. But it's very interesting what happened with Asher. I love this story of Asher, frankly. Asher was given a land grant that included Akko, Tyre, Sidon, even up to Byblos, right? So all of Lebanon, modern day Lebanon, and all the way down to what is now Haifa. And, but was Asher a seafaring people? No, they were port keepers. They were merchants. They were the ones that were merchandising all the stuff coming in from the Silk Road. Bring all those Chinese goods down here to our Walmart, and then we'll ship them out here from Akko, Tyre, Side, and Byblos into the Mediterranean for all these other cultures. So they were merchants, and they were capitalists. They were money makers. And because they were money makers and merchants, the guys down in Jerusalem liked to hit them with taxes. You know, you need to have a tax increase. We see you're working pretty hard up there. So we need it. We're going to have to hit you with a tax increase. We've got an excise tax, property tax, sales tax, income tax, personal tax, head tax, poll tax. We have a numerous set of taxes that we are going to have to apply to you. Why? Because we need to build a temple and I need a palace and, and I've got a thousand wives who have to be taken care of. Taxes are going up. And so they were taxed, 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 and taxed. But Asher is here along the coast running the ports, right? And now they had a king, Hiram. And Hiram was like super efficient, very capitalist merchant, right? You gotta remember that Akko would be the birthplace of the modern bank under the Knights Templar. That happened in Akko. But these guys were banking. And so Solomon comes to him and says, you know, Hiram, I know my dad commissioned you to, you know, come up with some stones and some timber for the temple. Have you still got that stuff? Oh, yeah, I got it. I got it here. Well, great. We want to, I've decided we want to build the temple. We want to build my palace. So I'm going to need a lot of timbers and I'm going to need a lot of cut limestone. Can you do it? Hiram says, yeah, I can do it. I can do it. However, I'm going to need something from you. What do you need? I want 22 cities. I want the 22 cities that were the land grant to Asher. I want them back. I want them under my leadership. Solomon, oh yeah, 22 cities, got it. I got, I'll cover you, I'll cover you on that one. And so Hiram performs. They cut every single limestone for the temple. They cut all the timbers. They get it all pre-shaped, pre-formed, everything's ready to go. They put it on ships. They take it down to Yafo. 
They get down to Yaffa and he tells Solomon, have your guys come down here, get the stuff, take it up to Jerusalem and build. Well, Solomon, those, those guys couldn't even figure out how to do that. What? Uh, how are we going to do that? So Hiram says, okay, look, I'll help you. I'll help you. So he helps load the stuff. He gets it up to Jerusalem. They get to constru constructing the temple and the palace. And Solomon says, oh, by the way, I got your 20 cities. We got this little village over here that's got six tents. We got that one Bedouin uh, outfit over here. There's a commune up just south of Mount, you know, whatever, right? And he gives them 20 thumbs. And Hiram is like, man, you have ripped me off blind. So Hiram is pretty ticked. Now, Solomon dies. In comes his son, Rehoboam. And his advisors come to him and say, okay, what should we do about this northern kingdom? They're still ticked at your dad. And as the old guys say, lower their taxes and they'll be loyal to you forever. Rehoboam says, okay, let me think about that. Then the young bucks come in there. You don't need to take any lip off that, Hiram. You're the king, crank it. So Rehoboam does just that. He raises the taxes, bada boom, civil war. Just like that, civil war and the kingdoms did in fact divide. And that was the beginning of the end of the kingdom of David, Yahud. But this tribe of Asher, when you start seeing the diaspora, they started moving. Now, this tribe of Asher would leave the coast with the reputation of being the Phoenicians. They'd leave the coast, which included Cyprus and Crete, where they were doing business. Kittim, Tarsus, right? Paul was part of that shipping empire. And they moved. Where, did, where was their next big haven? Venetia, Venice, tribe of Asher, the Venetian Republic, 1,080 years. And the Venetian Republic did what? Managed all of the freight in the Mediterranean. The goods coming out of the east, coming into Europe, the goods coming out of Europe into the east, all managed through Venice. And so when the Ottomans came there, they said, we're gonna put a siege on Venice. The Venetians are like, yeah, all right. So they show up and they completely circle Venice and they've got, and, you know, they've got them all sieged out. And after three years, the Venetians start catapulting bread over the wall to the Ottoman troops. Catapulting bread over. See, we're not hungry over here. We got plenty of food. We're not hungry. Can you catch our drift, right? They could put out a warship in 12 hours. 12 hours from start to finish, boom, sailing, right? I gotta tell you, I mean, I was so impressed with the Venetian Republic. We went through the Palazzo Ducale. And what you see, the difference that you see in the Venetian Republic, they had an Eastern Orthodox leadership over the Venetian Republic. So when you're in Venice, you have a portion that is the rich portion, which was a Byzantine in nature, the north of the, of the Grand Canal. And then you have the southern portion, Catholic in nature, poverty stricken. So here's the poor section, here's the rich, rich section. And when you go in and you see a Byzantine leadership, what do you see? You go into the Palazzo Ducale, here's where the doge sat, and you have a giant mural of who? The Messiah, not Mary, the Messiah. And in all of the murals throughout the Palazzo Ducale, it's the Messiah doing this, the Messiah ascending, the Messiah in Gethsemane, whatever it may be. And you have, of course, the palace of the doji and his sixth advisor because they had seven leaders, seven. And then you would go into the Supreme Court where they had 12 judges and they had a Senate and they had a House of Representatives where every landowner in Venice could have a person there, male or female. It was the largest building in Europe until the Jews built their synagogue in Turin, okay? So you see that that republic survived for 1,080 years. Now it's gone, Venice is gone now. I mean, it, the city's still there, but it's not a republic, it's part of Italy and, and you know, it's, they still have a separate language, of course, which is non-Italian, period. It's not even close to Italian. Well, they ended up somewhere else. Where's the tribe of Asher now? Well, I don't know, pretty simple to find. It's a place that has its own language, 
It's a place that's a seaport that's handling all the freight for the Mediterranean. Barcelona. Barcelona, Catalonia. And who is leading the spiritual revolution in Barcelona? You say to yourself, well, they have La Sagrada Familia, the biggest Catholic church in the Western world, right? That's still not finished. La Sagrada Familia. Must be Catholic. Well, I thought that too until I'm sitting in Barcelona and I turn on TV at 10 o'clock at night. I think there were 11 channels on, all doing tarot cards. Right? Tarot cards, psychic reading. And who was giving them the tarot cards? The gypsies. Why? Because the gypsies tell the goyim one thing and tell themselves another. Okay? And I can tell you right now that the Levite priesthood has not gone away. Scripture says the Torah is forever and the Levite priesthood is forever. That's a difficulty because people say, what are the Levite priests up to? Making trouble. <laughs> but anyway... <laughs> You, you can see here, now, so we got an idea. Now there's a, there's a couple more tribes that I'll just mention. The tribe of Naphtali is likely in the Philippines and throughout the islands in the South Pacific, including Hawaii. Ha-ya-wa. Ha-ya-wa. Hawaii gives the name of Yah. And one of the names of Yah, one of the titles of Yah is, you know, you have El, Elohim, Eloheka, Elohekim, Eloheinu, and the feminine form Eloah, Eloah, El Shaddai, El Elyon, but Eloah, right? Now some people in the Paleo word will say, well, it's not El, it's Al. It's Aluhim, not Elohim. You ever seen that? Aluhim, Shalom, Aluhim. Well, if it's Aluhim, then it's not uh, Eloa, it's Aloha, Aloha. Right? In the United States, we have this tribe that call themselves the Cherokee. But their leaders say it's not Cherokee at all, it's Shakari from Ishakar. And they have proven a DNA link from Ishakar, from the Shakari to the Mayans. They're basically the same people by DNA. And the Shakari, the Mayans leader, was a guy named Tula. Tula, the firstborn son of who? Ishakar. You have the tribe of Zebulun, the tribe of Asher, the tribe of Dan, which constituted the tribes along the St. Lawrence Waterway, who were in the process of mining copper for Solomon. Over 5,000 mines found in the Great Lake areas from around the time of 1000 BC. They were mining iron in Brazil, which in Hebrew is spelled Beit Zion Lamed. Uh, uh, yeah, Brazil. Beit Resh Zion Lamed. Brazil. Means iron in Hebrew. The covenant man, man is Ish, covenant is Brit. Brit Ish, the covenant man, British, they're at Mount Lud. Okay? So we begin to see where these tribes are. They're dispersed all over the world. And if we had only known, you know, Ephraim shows up in New England. We're Ephraim, we're Ephraim, we're here to conquer, right? Well, hey, guess what? We're Issachar. What? Yeah, we're Zebulun. What? We're Gad, we're Reuben. What are you guys doing here? What we got here before you? Hmm. Let's have a good time instead of killing each other. Didn't happen. There's one more tribe I want to talk about, though. I was had a discussion with a guy on Facebook about this two nights ago. And because I was mentioning the Japanese people in this NYS TV show that I did on Thursday. And so he commented, he said, what is this? There's a tribe in Japan, uh, what you would call a, um, uh, what's the word I'm thinking of? Aboriginal tribe in Japan. And they call themselves the Ainu. Ainu. Now this tribe is a very interesting tribe because they're capable of living in the colder weather in Japan without wearing much clothes. 
because they're literally covered with hair. And you see old, the older, they're almost all wiped out now, but they're, you see the older pictures of them. I mean, there's hair everywhere. I mean, they're just ha very hairy people, right? They're not particularly big people. They're dark-skinned people and hairy, but their hair has a reddish tint. Now, if you look at this name, Ainu, and you put that into the Hebrew, Ayan, Nu, Ayan means what? Zero, right? Ayan is another word for zero, zero. It also means eyes, but it means zero. Nu is our, right? Avinu, our father, Avinu. Eloheinu, our Elohim. Nu means our. So what does this Ainu mean? Our nothingness. You know, our inheritance, nothing. You remember Esau? You know, he took my birthright and then he took my inheritance and he's weeping in front of Yaakov. Father, do you have anything for me? And Yaakov says, I'm sorry, my son, I have nothing for you. Now, Yah says he lost it because he despised his birthright. He sold his birthright for a bowl of soup. Impetuous youth, right? How many young people make that mistake now? All of them do. But here's Esau. Where is the direct descendants? Japan, I knew, I knew. So when we see this now, we can see that these tribes have traveled around the world, right? The, the house of Yasharel is around the world. It's, and did I mention that the house of Zara in Spain, the Iberian people, there's 150 million descendants of the house of Zara in Latin America. You know, they say, well, you know, Mac in Scottish means son, MacDonald, the son of Donald. And the EZ in Spanish means son, right? So, the, you know, Juarez, Sanchez, Vasquez, Chavez, you know. But why does the EZ mean son? Because EZ erits Zion, the land of Zion. I am one of the land of Zion. Chavez, Vasquez, Perez. You see this? They were of the house of Zara, the red rampant lion. That's why in 1492, on the 10th of Av, they kicked all of the Jews out of Spain on the 9th of Av. The Alhambra decree. What was the sin? What was the sin? They taught the Hebrew calendar. They taught how to find the first day of the first month. They taught how to find the dates for Pesach. They taught the dates of the feast and they taught the seventh day Sabbath. Get out. Alhambra decree. And by the way, when you're heading out the door, don't take any of your money with you either. Right? So guess who the pirates of the Caribbean were? Spanish Jews. Guess who was on Columbus's ship? Spanish Jews. And guess what book Columbus used for his sailing? Fourth Ezra, looking for the land of Artsabeth, where the 10 tribes had gone to practice the Torah that they did not keep in the land when they were there. This is what it reads in fourth Ezra. They journeyed a long way off, a year and a half they journeyed to a land where no one had dwelled, that they might keep the Torah that they had not kept in the land when they were there. Fascinating, isn't it? So with that, I'm gonna, I don't know, open it up for questions. Go ahead and give that quote, fourth Ezra chapter 13, wasn't it? Yeah, it's fourth Ezra 13, yeah. And uh, go ahead and read that since you have it up there right there. Yeah. That is a great passage for closing, closing prayer. It is a great passage. And let's see if, we, um, let's see if I can find it here. Yeah, here it is. So this begins in 4th Ezra, chapter 13, beginning in 39. Yeah, let's start in verse 39, okay? And whereas you saw that he gathered another peaceable multitude unto him, 
Those are the ten tribes which were carried away prisoners out of their own land in the time of Husha the king, who Shalmaneser, the king of Ashur, led away captive, and he carried them over the waters, and so they came into another land. Yeah, and, but it could have been the waters even as far as the Indus River, right? But they took this counsel among themselves that they would leave the multitude of the heathen and go forth, forth into a further country where never mankind dwelt. That they might there guard their statutes which they never kept in their own land. That's America. Yeah. And they entered into Parath by the narrow places of the river, for El Elyon then showed signs for them, and held still the flood till they were passed over. For, th for through that country there was a great way to go, namely a year and a half. And the same region is called Artsareth. This is the same name that Columbus identified America with, Artsareth, if you look back at the old writings. That's right, because he had found Artsareth. This is actually in the Jewish encyclopedia to this day. This what does this tell you, right? And so we should make sure that whatever Bible you have doesn't have 4th Ezra in it. <laughs> you know, keep that out of there, right? Keep out those messianic prophecies of the book of Enoch. Get that out of there. And whatever you do, don't let anybody tell you that you're the chosen people because you guard the Shabbat, as it says in Jubilees chapter 2. Ignore the prophecies of 2nd Baruch at your peril. Knowledge is power. Yeah. And so what we see, I mean, I, I mean, look, I mean, you know, I'll just tell you, you know, you think we sat around here with some kind of intellectual genius and put this book together? No. It was the Ruach HaKodesh that gave us 100% of whatever it is that we're doing. And so I'm giving the credit to the Ruach and everybody who wants to, you know, call me an idiot, which they do. That guy's an idiot. He doesn't know anything about Hebrew. He doesn't know anything about scripture. He doesn't know anything about what he's doing. He can't even pronounce his own name for heaven's sakes. I tell him it's Stephen with a PH. You know, Fa Stephen with a PH. Anyway, uh, so I want to thank you guys for um, having me here today. And uh, it was just a blessing to be here. I hope um, that this has answered your questions about the traveling of the tribes. If you look in your Sefer, now I don't know about the first edition. If you have a first edition, you probably don't have them. But in the second, third, and 3ER1, which is this edition, third edition Rev1, now only two inches thick and weighing only four pounds with a 10-point font, we have maps in the back of the Sefer, okay? And these maps in the back of the Sefer do show the migration of the tribe of Dan, the migration of the tribe of God, the migration of the house of Judah, and it also shows the Exodus path that reflects the true Mount Sinai and true Mount Horeb, which as we know now is in Saudi Arabia. Right? So there's 10 maps in the back of the book. If you don't have the maps, in your, because you got Sefer, uh, oh, by the way, if you have Sefer version 1, you have until the 15th of this month, or if you have Sefer 1 or Sefer 2, you have until the 15th of this month to order Sefer 3 and get a 25% discount using 3ER1 as your code. If you don't want to order the book, but you want the maps, you can download the maps as a free download on the website. So you can get the maps, okay? And it traces the journeys that I've talked about today.